Uh, hi everyone, thank you for being here in person or virtually. Uh, my name is Anas uh, Serrani. I am a postdoctoral fellow at Surfax in Toulouse, uh, France. Uh, I'm working within the Center of Excellence Ways. Uh, as you can see on the screen, the topic of my presentation is about high performance hybrid coupling of a CFD solver to deep neural networks. Uh, this is a joint work with colleagues from, uh, from Surfax. And my talk is particularly relevant to those of you who are interested in exploiting uh, deep neural inference into computational fluid dynamics simulations. <clears throat> I have divided my presentation into three parts. I will start off by uh, showing uh, applications overview. And my second uh, point concerns the, the main part of my presentation, which is uh, the, the coupling strategies that we followed in order uh, to get a high performance coupling between uh, the CFD solver and deep neural network inferences. And finally, uh, I do like uh, to emphasize uh, pre preliminary physical results and performance analysis. Uh, as you may know, deep, deep learning or neural, net, neural networks are rapidly becoming a modeling approach, an important modeling approach in computational uh, fluid dynamic simulations. These models uh, show a potential to outperform classical literature schemes. Indeed, instead of uh, using a classical model or a classical scheme to compute a quantity of interest, we take advantage of a data-driven model to estimate this quantity. Let me int introduce uh, an application overview. Uh, it comes out of uh, premixed turbulent combustion. We have a methane uh, slot burner configuration. And in order to get a physical reaction rate, uh, we take advantage of uh, convolutional neural networks neural network that outputs the subgrid scale from wrinkling from the, the progress variable. Uh, the data needed to train this network has uh, been produced by uh, DNS at direct numerical simulations. So how could we use this neural network inference during the runtime of our safety, uh, of our safety simulations? Uh, I will come up with the answer in two minutes. Another, uh, another application of deep neural networks in safety, in, in safety computation is the modeling of, of the wall law uh, for turbulent flows. Generally, uh, wall models reduce the computational requirements of a large ED simulation with high Reynolds numbers, number for, for turbulent uh, flows by allowing the use of course of says that was. Uh, here, uh, our wall model is not an, uh, here our, our wall model is not an algebraic one. It is a data-driven model, technically. And uh, here we use a graph neural network to predict the wall shear stress from the velocity, and then we can update the boundary conditions. So I ask again, how could we use the neural network inference during, this, during the runtime of our safety simulation? The answer is AVPPDL. AVPPDL is a high performance coupling of the CFD solver AVPP to deep neural network inference. Uh, AVPPDL is based on AVPP, which is the Surfax suite of safety tools uh, to perform DNS and DLS of compressible reacting turbulent multi-species flows on massively parallel architectures. These, these safety computations are generally executed on the central processing unit CPUs. And besides, we have established uh, a deep learning code and program uh, which is written in Python and exploiting uh, efficient deep learning libraries such as PyTorch on, and TensorFlow. So this code is generally running on, on general purpose GPUs. Uh, and to exchange data between these two programs, we rely on coupling interfaces such as the classical message passing interface MPI 
or uh, Sweepy, which is a coupling technology developed by Onera. And technically to run an AVBPDL simulation, we use uh, multiple program, multiple data executions. Although AVBPDL enables two coupling strategies and uh, let me elaborate on this point. The first uh, strategy of couplings allows that data exchanges uh, between uh, the AVBP solver and the DL program when uh, both when both instances AVBP and DL have non-matching meshes. So the coupling interface here is SWEEPY. SWEEPY stands for coupling with interpolation parallel interface as an application using convolutional neural networks in AVBP DL requires a, a voxel grid. And since AVBP is generally, or for example, in, in our case, running on operating on tetra tetrahedrons, uh, the use of SWEEPY is uh, inescapable. Uh, let's look uh, uh, in a bit more detail in this, uh, let's look at this coupling in a bit more detail. So in uh, the runtime pre-processing, Sweepy uh, localize these two meshes and create a mapping between the unstructured grid of AVBP and the structured grid of VDL. And then during the temporal uh, loop of our runtime, AVBP starts computing. Then we get our quantity of interest and Sweepy here interpolate this quantity of interest into the uh, voxel grid. It sends uh, the data to the DL program. We perform a distributed prediction. Uh, we get the output, and then again, Sweepy interpolates uh, the output into the unstructured, unstructured grid, and then we can apply uh, the output and advances next time step. Uh, to make the link with the slot burner simulation, the quantity of interest here is the progress variable. The output is the uh, subgrid scale frame wrinkling, which is obtained by the prediction of the, of the convolutional neural networks. And uh, we apply the output by uh, updating uh, the uh, reaction rate. Although the second strategy is used when we have more sophisticated neural networks, uh, such as graph neural, neural networks that are able to operate directly on the uh, structured grid. So the strategy is based on MPI as a coupling interface. And we and also we construct a graph from the wanted section of our ABBP mesh. And uh, uh, particularly, uh, particularly, particularly, we create a mapping in the pre-processing of the runtime, a mapping between the AVBP and the DL processes, and we can also aggregate AVBP partitions into uh, the DL program. And in the same fashion, we can exchange data between AVBP and the DL program by using direct uh, MPI communications since no interpolation is needed. And to make the link with the whole model simulation, the quantity of interest is, is the velocity. Here, the output is the wall share stress obtained by the inference of the graph neural network. And here to update, to apply the output, we update the boundary conditions. Uh, let's move on to uh, the coupling results. Here, my slot burner, uh, my slot burner simulation has as a setup an EVPP mesh of uh, two trusses with 16, uh, 16 million mesh nodes. My voxel grids uh, for the DL program, I have a voxel grid with 10 million, <coughs> with 10 million mesh nodes, and I can see that the voxel grid is re reduced to the region where uh, my flame flows. Uh, the computing resources deployed in this, uh, for this simulation are hybrid, uh, hybrid computing node of the uh, CNRS uh, supercomputer Jonesy. So each, each node has uh, 40 Intel Cascade Lake cores and equipped with for uh, NVIDIA V100 GPUs. 
And for AVBP, uh, we set three uh, 36 CPUs per node. And for the deal program, we set four CPUs managing uh, the four GPUs per node. Uh, preliminary result has been obtained. To, to illustrate this uh, on the left, I have the progress, uh, the progress variable, which is the input of my convolutional network is plot. And on the right, I have the, the output, which is the subgrid, uh, subgrid scale frame wrinkling. And uh, maybe you are wondering what is the additional cost that we paid to couple our safe dissolver to a neural network inference. So, so since AVVP is running on CPUs, uh, the DARE program is running on GPUs and you can have also some uh, time uh, computation overlap. There, is, uh, there are several ways to compute the additional deep learning cost. So we, I propose the following approach. Uh, here uh, I have the timeline which shows explicitly uh, the computation, uh, the prediction, and the interpolation. And sorry, and the coupling routines uh, on a full time uh, iteration of AVPDL. On the left and on the left and on the right, we can see these two delimiters uh, representing the iteration start and iteration end. And on the top, it's AVVP timeline. Uh, on the, at the bottom is the deep learning uh, timeline. So here, AVVP starts computing, interpolates the quantity, and we have this event of sending uh, the, the data to the DARE program. And we can see that we have uh, some time, uh, computing time overlapping. So AVVP keeps on computing until it needs uh, the predicted data. So we can see here that we have a uh, waiting phase which, which depends uh, which depends especially on the prediction time so the additional cost uh, of the deep learning uh, it can be measured by the sum of the interpolation time and the waiting time so for our uh, slot burner simulation here uh, the del cost is 0.76%, uh, which is promising. And that means that that the additional, I, uh, that means that the deep learning inference, uh, I can say that I get for free. And I can zoom on, on this DL cost. I can see that three quarters of these DL cost has been token by the interpolation. And, uh, and I can see that AVVP here was not waiting for a long time, that means that my prediction was not long. Uh, since uh, AVVP, is, since our solver is a, a coupling of a massively parallel uh, safety solver, uh, it is relevant to, to measure the scalability of, of the solver. So, uh, so here on, I uh, show a strong scaling result, which me measures the ability of my solver to perform well or better with varying the number of resources for a fixed, for a fixed problem size. So here on, on the left, I have a figure, uh, this figure reports uh, the AVBP uh, time iteration with the, the DL cost ratio. Uh, versus the number of computing nodes we 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 use. So here I have a, a satisfactory DL cost ratio. On uh, in the middle I have the speed up of AVVP DL, which has a clear linear trend. And on on the left I have the prediction uh, speed up. Uh, a decline of uh, the speed up is observed after 16 GPUs since. Uh, the size of data per GPU is not sufficient to be scaled. Uh, I can, I'm a, time okay? Uh, I'm approaching the, the end of, uh, of my presentation. So here is the simulation of the wall model. So it is a NACA uh, 65 uh, airfoil on a flat plate. So here my AVBP mesh has uh, 30 uh, million uh, mesh nodes. This is my mesh. 
And for my wall model, I have this graph here on this side of the mesh and in the blade. So my graph uh, node has uh, my graph has uh, two million uh, node and uh, twenty five million edges. So the used graph neural network has a, as input uh, the boundary mask, the vector, uh, the velocity, the velocity vector on nodes, and the displacement vector on edges. Here I have a, a section. Uh, with respect to x axis of my velocity, and here is an example of <laughs> an example of of the output, which is the wall shear stress. Uh, also, I have a good uh, scaling result. So here is the del cost. Uh, here is the AVPP del speed up, which which keeps a can say a linear uh, speed up, and here I. I see that I have a lack of prediction uh, for 32 GPUs, which explains here the, the high ratio of my Dell costs. So uh, to conclude, uh, let me just run through uh, the key points of my presentation. We built up a high performance hybrid coupling of ABBP software to deep neural networks. We set up two coupling strategy for both uh, CNN and JNN. We have a satisfactory scaling and uh, performance result, and also as well as prelim preliminary physical results. And we are currently in the process of investigating uh, physical validation of these uh, neural networks and also a generalization to more use cases. So that, that uh, brings me to the end of my presentation. And if you have any question, I would be pleased to answer. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Anas. Uh, do we have online questions? We'll check immediately. Uh, no, at the moment. I've never had online questions. <laughs> okay. So. so, thanks a lot for the nice presentation. I have a couple of questions. So, first, if you I believe you said that uh, you use Fortran for the solver side. Yeah. yeah. So if you can comment more on the coupling mm, between Fortran and Python, mm, specifically if there are certain libraries that uh, are used to have a fast coupling, and, mm, so to like to couple the, the variables. And then uh, the second one is that if you can, uh, do you want to, to answer the first one or? Okay. So. Okay. So here, uh, so my my program, uh, my server AVPDL has two programs. So we run this uh, an AVP simulation using multiple program, multiple data execution. So here I have an MPI run with the first uh, uh, AVP program, and then I have the DL program. So I have here. Uh, I, so using this this uh, execution model, I can create a global communicator that contains both of these two programs. So here, AVP is written in Fortran, and here in Python. So the communication uh, the communications had been done using direct MPI communication. If uh, if no interpolation is needed, for example, for the graph case, and when I have uh, non-matching meshes. Uh, uh, an interpolation is required, so I will use this coupling uh, interface that can in, that can uh, performs uh, fully parallel communications and also performs the interpolation on the fly of the data. Uh, is it clear? Yeah. Okay. So, and the second one, if you can give some more information about the well modeling procedure, is that the, maybe is there is, is there a single uh, wall normal point in which you exchange the inputs and also have you considered the other inputs than what you you said okay thanks thanks uh, uh, for the moment uh, as an input we have only the velocity vector and the displacement vector and the displacement vector uh, the velocity information are located on nodes and uh, the displacement vector are located on edges. So, so this is my configuration uh, of the uh, graph neural network. What is the first part of your question?
uh, for the moment, we have only this input. Yeah, what do you think uh, that we can add as an input, for example? Pressure gradient. Yes. Huh? Pressure gradient. <laughs> okay. 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 Okay, thank you. If I can have a, a question uh, slightly on the same trend, but a bit more uh, uh, turbulent question. Yeah. You get tau. How do you uh, put uh, uh, tau into your Naviestock solver? Do you do it directly? Because if you do something like this, you're going to get uh, a bit of uh, uh, a bit of numerical instability. I'm afraid I don't have the exact answer but i think in avbp the boundary conditions are set yeah. weekly okay uh, uh but, but i don't have the, the the exact the exact answer okay yeah i have a question can you go back to uh, slide 19 okay so i understand avbp runs on the on the cpu yeah and who gets the uh, the structured mesh it's you have it's another code running on the cpu yeah, for Python here, I have four CPUs managing the the four GPUs. So the communication, the creation of this mesh is done on CPUs. Only the prediction is done on GPUs. Okay, but so you have processes for AVBP, you have processes for the interpolation mesh? Uh, we ha I have processes for AVBP and processes for DL program. Ah, okay, it's including the DL yeah. uh, program. Okay, okay. So for, for the DL program, CPUs are managing data inputs, data exchanges, creation of the mesh, and GPUs are performing only prediction. Okay, thank you. I, I have a question. I'm Harsha from Kaust. Uh, so for my first question is, how do you optimize the data transfer from your uh, AVBP to the DL framework? And the second question is, uh, how do you make sure that your GPUs are completely utilized? What is the size of the data which you are sending to each uh, GPU? Uh, the f okay, could you repeat please the first question? Uh, I just want to make. Uh, I just wanted to know, like, how do you make sure that you are efficiently transferring the data from AVBP to DL framework? Because both are, both have uh, both are on different architectures. One is on CPU and the other one is on GPU. Uh, the data. Uh, okay, thank you. The data in in the DIR program uh, is on the CPU. So we use only the GPUs for the prediction. So here, this mesh, uh, the received quantity are in the CPU memory. Uh, so the transfer the transfer of data toward the GPU is done here and the, the backward transfer is, do is done here. So the, the, the exchange is done only on, on the CPUs. Okay. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, but I just wanted to know, like, what is the size of your data and how much time okay. you are spending in the data transfer? Okay. Uh, you, you can see here. So, you, you your question is about the size of data that I use per GPU. That's it. Yeah, how yeah. many data you are moving from the G CPU to GPU and uh, what it is I'm the size? Using, uh, I'm moving uh, around, for example, for this. Uh, sorry. For, for example, for this, for this simulation and for one computing node, uh, the data per uh, the, the data transfer between the CPU and GPU is 2.5 million uh, array of double precision number okay so here my mesh has 10 million so i have four gpus so each gpu has an array of 2.5 million uh, array of double precision pointers uh, of double precision number okay is it clear yeah yeah thanks okay is there more uh, question online okay uh it's a simple question. I mean, I uh, uh, so you, you train your DL on the DNS data, right? Yes. And your uh, prediction that you're doing is it on the same regime of Reynolds number, or it is on a different? 
for this simulation. Uh, I mean, your training versus your coupling, wherever you're doing, are they on the same regime of Reynolds number? Uh, I'm saying, are you doing extrapolation or is it just interpolation? I'm afraid I don't have the so exact. For, if, so, so if your DNS is in Reynolds number, say 10,000, for example. Yeah. And your uh, the coupled one, are you doing the simulation in 100,000 or is it still 10,000? Uh, to be honest, uh, I don't have the exact information. Okay. Because if it's just interpolation, the cost of training it and then uh, it should be added as well, right? So every time you change your Reynolds number or flow regime, your DL needs to be trained again. I, I don't know. That's what I heard yesterday that they were saying you can't do the jump. Yeah, similarity. Similarity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We have one minute. Very fast. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And I have a simple doubt. How how do you change the data types, the Python classes to the Fortran uh, vector data types? How do you do that? Do you have a, a wrapper in between to convert these data types? Uh, no. So uh, in, in I'm using uh, NumPy arrays uh, in Python. So NumPy library has ability to transform C arrays to Fortran arrays. I think so we need to move to the next presentation. <laughs> then uh, you, you ask him uh, after the, the session. Uh, that's all. Okay, thanks again. Oh, thank you. So next speaker is Laurent André. So Laurent, you can just yes, start. Hello. Can you see my presentation? Yes. All right. Then, um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. My name is Laurent André. I'm a research assistant at the Institute of Aerodynamics of the RWTH Aachen. And today's talk is about the prediction of unsteady uh, flows using a generative adversarial network with uh, additional lattice Boltzmann losses. So to motivate our work, we know that CFD servers can, depending on the method that we choose, be highly accurate, but they often are time consuming and costly in terms of computing resources. So we see that artificial neural networks are emerging cheaper and potentially even uh, the same accurate uh, alternative. So the idea is that um, with a neural network, we train and minimize the loss function. And for the prediction of images, this is often only the difference between ground truth and generated images. And in our uh, work here, we now add an additional loss term to also include to some degree the, the physical loss of our problem. And for this, we studied uh, two dimension and three dimensional flow around a circular cylinder. And um, the idea is basically that we give to our GAN, so to our generative adversarial network, a certain input sequence consisting of a few time steps, and that our network can then predict the next time step of that sequence. Um, our training data is based on the on uh, the lattice Boltzmann method. So we predict here particle probability distribution functions. And also our physical loss that we will be adding to the network is based on the lattice Boltzmann method. Our predictions are then at Reynolds numbers that were not part of the training, but within the overall uh, range of the training data. The inspiration for this work comes from Lee and Yu. We use a similar or the same network structure for the prediction of macroscopic variables. And they then included a physical loss that was rather based on the navier stokes equations. So, they, they focused on mass and momentum conservation. And um, as already mentioned, for our train data, we use uh, the lattice Boltzmann method. And for this, we use the solver of our own in house simulation framework, Multiphysics AIA. And um, what we basically do here is we solve the Boltzmann equation with the VGK collision term. And um, for the two dimensional case, we use a discretization of uh, nine distributions functions, so the D2Q9 model. 
And in 3D, we used uh, the D3227 model. In terms of computational domain, um, we have an illustration here. So we use something about uh, 64 times the diameter and of length and 30 times the diameter and width. And um, we basically impose the velocity uh, at the inland, inlet boundary condition. At the outlet, we then have a fixed um, density. At the top and bottom of our domain, we use slip boundary conditions, and the cylinder is um, in no slip boundary condition, has uh, no slip boundary condition imposed. Now, for the computation domain, we need to do a bit bigger, but in terms of the region that interests us most is around the cylinder. So, for the network, we predict what is here labeled as cutout, and also our training samples will be taken out from this cutout section. In 3D, we then to do a very similar domain and then include the periodic boundary conditions in the z direction. So when we talk about it again, we usually have a generator that generates our samples and a discriminator that differentiates between generated image and ground truth, so real and fake images basically. And the idea is that the two networks help each other to improve. In our case, we uh, applied a multi-scale fully convolutional network Fully convolutional means that we can train the network with smaller patches and then predict the full um, cutout or region that we're interested in. Um, in our case, we now use four different scales to capture different flow features um, with the same uh, input, let's say. And um, our input consists of four time steps here. Each time step has um, the uh, the width, height, and in 3D, the depth, and then also the uh, tensor of uh, the number of distributions. So it's quite a big input that we give to the network. This is then processed to the four stages of our generator. And finally, we output again uh, the denormalized data to then compute from these predicted predictions, for instance, the microscopic variables. The discriminator that we use here um, is different for 2D and 3D. In 2D, we used a uh, discriminators, so again, four discriminators for each stage. And here it's a mix of convolutional layers, a much pool layer, and fully connected layers. And um, in 3D, to, due to memory reasons, we then switch over to also a fully convolutional discriminator, since the fully connected layers uh, uh, become rather large in that case. Um, when we now take a look at the uh, training itself, our discriminators are trained using a binary cross entropy loss. So basically, we give the network the output of the ground truth, and we um, use the binary cross entropy loss with a label of one. And for the um, generated image, we use the label zero, which then basically remounts to the two traces displayed here on the plot. So the further we are away, from one for the ground truths, the higher the loss, and vice versa for the generated images. Our generator now is a combined loss. This um, combined loss consists of a L2 loss that basically, as initially already stated, reduces or minimizes the difference between the generated and the ground truth images. Then we have a gradient difference loss, which was introduced by Matthews and others. Who, um, who first came up with this approach of using again for uh, uh, with an input sequence to learn the spatial temporal features. And they found out that this, to minimize the, the difference in gradients of generated and um, ground truth would help to reduce blurriness that was typical for such predictions using uh, input sequences. Then we have the typical adversarial loss uh, for again, and our newly added physical loss, where we propose two different versions in the next slide. So we, in terms of weights, we try to, to have the weights all in the same order of magnitude, uh, the losses all in the same order of magnitude. And um, this is also basically what Lee and you did in their uh, work. And this, we tested out that these weights worked, worked best. The first physical loss that we propose is based on the discrete velocity, BGK approximation. And here we 
applied simple finite differences. So basically in, in time we use uh, backward finite differences uh, and in space decentralized finite differences. And um, for the second clause that we propose, we use the discretized lattice BGJ equation. So our solver is doing this in a two-step fashion. So we have the propagation and collision step. And uh, we basically use the, the results from the propagation step as bound truths as our training data to minimize the residual data. Mm. To evaluate our results, we train the network with image patches of 32 by 32 in 2D, respectively with tubes of edge length 32 in 3D. And we basically took random selected patches or tubes from within our region of interest. And for this, we took 64 um, tubes or patches for each input sequence uh, and a total of 2,000 input sequences. The network is then evaluated using the average L2 error between ground truth and predicted images. And uh, we use 64 input sequences for the evaluation, so for the validation. And here we use not only the patch, but the full region of interest for the testing. Our um, training data was uh, split up in two different sets. So we once tested at a, we have a set with Reynolds numbers between 110 and 150, where the training was done at 100, uh, the testing was done at 140. So we see that this is not part of the training. And uh, the other range was between 200 and 800 while the testing was conducted at a Reynolds number of 700 based on the cylinder diameter. When we now train this network using uh, different um, multiple ones with different random seeds um, and look at the average error and um, the standard deviation, we see that um, basically physical loss one was not really improving the output, even the error was higher with this loss. For the 2D case in both test cases, 140 and 700, the um, physical loss two slightly improved our results, but overall only marginal improvements could be seen. If we dive a bit deeper into how the errors are now um, distributed, so if we look at each of the nine distributions in 2D separately, we see that most of the errors are located around the boundary of the cylinder itself. And there are some errors in the weight of the cylinder, but this is rather restrained to the distributions in the uh, corresponding to the main Cartesian directions, let's say. A similar um, state would be seen at the higher Reynolds number of 700, although overall the errors increased here by almost a factor of eight. Um, but still, most of the highest errors are still located around the boundary and the cylinder itself. Again, the main Cartesian directions here, one, two, three, and four, have the highest errors. From this predicted, um, from this predicted particle probability density functions, we can now compute the microscopic variables, which is basically what we are interested in. And if we now take a look at the non-dimensional screen-wise velocity, um, we can see that again here, most of the errors are around the boundary. Um, here, the first case is without physical loss, then with physical loss one and physical loss two. We see that in physical loss one, especially in front of the cylinder, we have higher um, errors, which explains also why the, loss, the error was uh, worse in the plot before. However, overall, the flow field behind uh, the cylinder is very well predicted. If we now go a step further and take a look at our 3D results, so we trained this again with uh, at the lower in Reynolds number range. Here at 140, we see that overall we have a bit more fluctuations in our error, so we are not that steadily decreasing anymore, but we must uh, also acknowledge that we have now uh, three times more distributions to predict and also a third dimension. And um, in this case, however, the physical loss one was even performing best, so compared to the case before. 
We think that this could be related to the um, difference in mesh size, but we could not yet investigate this further. Um, overall, the predictions of uh, in the 3D case are um, accurate. We see a good prediction even for the full 3D domain case. So in this case, we see uh, for the Reynolds number 140, 10 isochrons between the mean and max value of the streamwise, the non-dimensional streamwise velocity computed from the predicted particle probability density functions. If we take again a look at um, the macroscopic variables, so if we now take a slice to the center of, of, the, um, of the 3D uh, image seen here, we see that the errors again are even more dominantly here place around the cylinder itself. Um, and we see that uh, without physical loss, there are a bit more errors also in the flow field behind uh, the cylinder. And um, this would bring me to our, my conclusion. So overall, we found that the lattice Boltzmann again was able to produce good predictions for uh, Reynolds numbers that were not part of the training. Um, however, generally we can say that for the tested uh, case here of uh, a circular cylinder, there was not really a huge benefit uh, when using the physical loss and the difference were marginal. The um, highest errors were in the two Reynolds regimes and 2D and 3D, uh, mostly around the cylinder itself and the boundary. So here we probably uh, have to dive a bit deeper and see if we can come up with an improvement or adding a special loss for this boundary condition. And um, the next step would then be to uh, also evaluate our 3D GAN for the prediction at the higher Reynolds number regime compared with the 2D results. And um, what we're looking for as an additional uh, step would now be that instead of looking at, a, at different Reynolds numbers, uh, focusing on one Reynolds number, but then investigate the influence if we train that with varying shapes and see how well we can generalize it to different shapes and not only a simple circular cylinder, let's say. And uh, with that, I would like you all to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Okay, thank you, Laurent. We have a, just one, one question. We have time for a very short question. No? Is there any question online? No, ju just, uh, just to summarize, uh, how do you explain why the uh, taking into account these physical losses is useless? Uh, how you mean useless? Well, you say it's just a margin uh, change in accuracy. Yeah. Um, why we only have a marginal uh, change, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say that in this case, the, the probably the, the L2 loss that we have is already doing most of the work to produce highly accurate uh, predictions. So the physical loss could not really help much in this case, but we believe that if we go to more complex problems, different particle shapes, there it would become uh, helpful to, to guide the, the network towards a more physical correct solution uh, and faster maybe. Okay, okay, thank you, Laurent. So we will proceed to the, well, thanks again. <laughs> thank you. So we'll proceed to the next talk. Okay, so Rianfa is going to talk about improving confidence on CFD by deep learning. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Um, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, in, uh, share with you uh, our research on identifying uh, flow characteristics with uh, graph convolutional neural networks. Um, I'm from uh, I'm Lian Fa Wong uh, from uh, uh, EDF. 
my supervisor, uh, Yuan Fengni and uh, Ran Fengshua Wood from uh, EDF and uh, Professor uh, uh, Yusuf Miski from the Bach Tech. So I will start to uh, introduce the context and objective of my uh, of our research, and uh, I will introduce you uh, the uh, convolution uh, graph convolutional neural network architecture that we uh, designed to uh, to identify the vortex in the uh, CFD results. So uh, and then I will int uh, introduce you the results and the discussion, and uh, finally uh, the uh, conclusion. So. Uh, the context and, and object of our uh, research is that uh, we all know that uh, CFD result qualities are very sensitive to uh, to model selection and uh, uh, numerical parameters, and also uh, uh, very sensitive to uh, user experience. So, for example, uh, if you want to uh, predict the uh, 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 the tangential uh, velocity magnitude in the outlet. Uh, Part of this uh, vortex generator case, you you will uh, if you use a, a, a RANS model, uh, you cannot uh, uh, accurately predict the, uh, this uh, tangential velocity uh, magnitude uh, distribution. But uh, if you use uh, uh, LES, you can uh, precisely uh, capture this uh, distribution. And uh, another case is that, is that uh, if you uh, do not uh, if your mesh is not really fine enough, you can not get uh, a precise uh, lift force prediction around the cylinder in this uh, kind of flow. So our ob objective is to uh, automate the flow characteristic char characteristics de detection to recommend uh, flow, uh, recommend uh, uh, model selection like uh, the turbulence model, like uh, the uh, uh, mesh refinement to uh, help the user to um, get a, a better uh, CFD uh, result. And uh, this is the long, long, long term goal. So for now, we are focusing on the first step that is to uh, accurately um, identify the flow, uh, flow phenomena in the CFD results. So now, what, what do we have? On, on, on one hand, we have a uh, very, um, have a high fidelity uh, simulator, which is the closed train uh, developed by uh, EDF. It is uh, an open source uh, 3D FM uh, software. and. Uh, on the other hand, we uh, they have accumulated a lot of ex uh, uh, simulation um, experience on uh, very different uh, uh, flow cases. So these are very good um, uh, 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 data set for machine learning uh, and deep learning uh, methods uh, to uh, to identify the, the flow phenomena. So we intend to uh, detect uh, four uh, basic. Uh, flow phenomena that uh, that uh, uh, vortex and uh, 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 thermal stratification uh, boundary layer and uh, jet. So now we are focusing on the first uh, flow phenomena that is the vortex. Uh, there are many uh, machine learning algorithms uh, which which are used to detect the flow feature. The most uh, popular one is a uh, convolutional neural network since uh, it's very efficient. It it uses a shared uh, 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 convolutional kernel to detect the uh, the feature the features in the uh, in the image and it is uh, very accurate. You can see here uh, it it can precisely uh, pre uh, predict the uh, pressure distribution around the, the cylinder based on the detected the, the uh, detected uh, uh, vortex shredding pattern and uh, it is hi highly uh, developed since the um, since the, uh, uh, thanks to the uh, recent uh, rapid develop development in the computer. Computer uh, vision science. However, it uh, also has a, a huge uh, disadvantage. Uh, that is, uh, it requires that the input must be uh, uh, re re reorganized into a rectangle, really like uh, 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 like, like an image. So it is not suitable for for the flow cases uh, with uh, very complex uh, geometry geometries and uh, uh, and uh, uh, with. Uh, uh, with the uh, unstructured mesh and uh, also 3D cases, these are very uh, very uh, common uh, in the uh, real industrial cases. So we need to find a a, a mesh adaptive me method to resolve our, our problem. So graph convolutional neural network uh, neural network is a uh, an, is a an, uh, is a mesh adaptive uh, method. So what what is uh, GCN? GCN is a one type of GN. GN 
uh, see the data as a graph. It is, uh, uh, it is very natural to see the uh, uh, safety mesh as a graph. The cells in mesh are the nodes in the uh, graph and the internal uh, faces in the safety mesh uh, represent, uh, represent the connectivity since uh, uh, so it, uh, they are the edges uh, in graph and uh, GN can, uh, if, uh, can learn these uh, uh, patterns embedded in this uh, uh, data structure. So as a popular GN, GCN gathers the information from uh, neighbors to the central node using convolution kernel, which is very similar to that in uh, CN. So how, how does the uh, convolution uh, kernel works? Uh, it works uh, uh, mainly in, uh, in two steps. First, it gathers the information from uh, from the from the uh, neighbor node to the uh, to the center node, and uh, it uh, combines uh, this gathered information with the, the uh, information stored in this uh, uh, center node to update the uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 information the information stored in this uh, center node, and with uh, um, stacking more layers, it can gather the uh, information from uh, uh, from the nodes far, uh, further away from the uh, inter uh, from the uh, from, uh, to the to the center node, and we designed this uh, convolution layer. Uh, uh, it contains the two steps. Uh, the first uh, the first one is the edge convolution, and the second one the uh, node convolution. Both uh, both use a, a, a two layer forward neural network as a convolution kernel for the uh, edge convolution. It uh, first uh, gathers the information from the uh, from the connected uh, nodes to the uh, to the uh, to the to the edge, and uh, it uh, um, all all the data are fed uh, uh, to the to the input of this uh, two layer uh, forward neural network, and uh, it uses the uh, uh, rectified linear unit as a activation uh, function. Then uh, the uh, the hidden feature stored on the uh, edge. Uh, is up, uh, is updated by this uh, uh, convolution kernel, and then all the uh, information stored on the ad on the edges uh, are, are further uh, gathered and uh, updated by another uh, uh, forward neural net neural network to update uh, the hidden feature uh, in this uh, uh, central node. So this is the the uh, general uh, struct uh, architecture of our GCN. Uh, GCM uh, algorithm. It contains uh, each uh, blocks. Each block, each block uh, contains a convolution uh, layer, which is uh, introduced before and followed by a, a smoothing layer. Smoothing layer. It uh, uh, it pro performs uh, edge smooth and uh, uh, node smooth. Uh, the purpose is to smooth the sp spatial uh, distribution of the uh, extracted uh, features and uh, uh, a, a unite like. Uh, uh, skip connection is also uh, introduced to this architecture to stabilize the training and uh, also improve the accuracy. And uh, finally, a fully uh, connected layer uh, matches the and the extracting the features to uh, final uh, classification, uh, the vortex zone and uh, all non vortex zone. So the next step, a uh, very important uh, uh, step, is to uh, correctly select the input for the. Uh, uh, for the uh, uh, GCN model. So uh, there are um, many uh, criteria to, uh, to meet for these uh, input. First, uh, it should be a uh, uh, non-dimensional or physical uh, value, and then it should be considered in various uh, uh, flow cases uh, to guarantee uh, its uh, general reality. And uh, it, it is better to have a, a spatial distribution, and uh, uh, it should be a, a, a combination of several variables since uh, uh, we, we do not have a uh, universal de definition of the vortex uh, um, location. So here was, we selected three uh, vortex indicators. The first one, the uh, turbulence intensity. So we can see uh, for this one, um, it uh, covers most. Uh, it covers uh, it. It's a main, um, it covers the. Um, uh, vortex uh, reading and for the uh, the second pressure gradient along uh, streamline, it, you can see this uh, uh, clear border which uh, split uh, split the uh, the field into a high value reading and a low value reading. And uh, uh, the last one, the deviation from a uh, shear flow, you can clearly see this characteristic uh, characteristic line uh, which goes through the uh, vortex 
Um, so these are uh, very good uh, indicators for uh, what vortex location and for other uh, vortex indicate, indicators. Uh, one, uh, the most uh, well-known one is uh, uh, Q criteria. Uh, however, uh, Q criteria is uh, very good for um, for the uh, backward-facing step case, but uh, uh, it is not a good vortex indicator in um, other two uh, flow cases. So. For this kind of vortex indica indicator, we uh, we don't select them. And uh, for the uh, data site uh, formation, we select uh, one uh, flow case from the validation cases of course uh, trend. Uh, that is a, a diffuser case. It is a, a fully uh, turbulent uh, flow case. And uh, uh, behind this slope, there is a, a a vortex. Uh, we uh, calculated this case uh, uh, with the seven combinations of different uh, uh, turbulence models and uh, uh, meshes. And for the validation and uh, uh, testing cases, we, we selected these three uh, flow cases, uh, periodic uh, hill flow case and backward facing step flow case and uh, ribs. So uh, we use the Adam uh, optimizer, which uh, can, uh, uh, can dynamically uh, um, uh, adjust uh, the uh, learning rate during the training uh, process, and uh, we, we selected the bin binary cross entropy as the uh, loss function, and we trained the uh, GC model for 200 epochs. And uh, uh, you can see uh, here, uh, you may, uh, if we uh, further uh, increase the training epoch, the, the training loss and the uh, validation loss will not further uh, decrease. Here for the uh, classification on the uh, training cases, uh, on the left, you can see uh, our proposed uh, uh, GCN model can uh, accurately classify the, um, uh, uh, the vortex reading in this uh, in these training cases. And uh, it's, uh, it, it achieves a very high score on, on these uh, three uh, uh, metrics. And on the... Um, on the unseen cases, uh, the GCN model uh, still can give us a very precise uh, uh, classification of the vortex uh, location. And uh, its uh, classification on these unseen cases is also comparable uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, the classification on, 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 the, uh, train, uh, on, the, on the training cases. And uh, here we made our uh, very preliminary uh, test on 2D cases. Here the, the GC model is trained on, on 2D cases. So here for, for this one, you can see the, the GC model can uh, accurately uh, classify, uh, capture the, the uh, vortex uh, region around this uh, cube in the, inside this uh, uh, duct. And uh, however, it, it also uh, made some mistake on, mis uh, on misclassifying uh, the far weak region as a, uh, a, a, a vortex region. So this is uh, not very good. And also we tested on the uh, vortex generator case. For this case, the flow field is very different from uh, the cases included in the training case. So uh, for our model, it cannot uh, give us a, a meaningful uh, classification. So we, uh, for, for this, uh, for this, uh, uh, stage, uh, uh, our GCN model cannot be uh, naively extended to uh, uh, 3D cases. For the future, we, we should uh, include more 3D cases in our uh, training data set. And we also uh, tested its uh, uh, applicability to uh, local or partial CFD data. Here, the, the diffuser case is uh, calculated in, uh, in parallel. And uh, the fluid, the fluid domain is uh, split into four ranks. Here you can see if we find the um, the data of the entire uh, fluid domain, the GCN can uh, accurately uh, capture the uh, vortex position under uh, under the shape. However, if we just uh, uh, feed the partial data, which is uh, allocated to the uh, to the uh, to the to a single uh, rank. The, the 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 GCN model cannot uh, predict uh, cannot identify the the trim uh, uh, region of this uh, vortex, so uh, it means that uh, our GCN model uh, does not make the uh, classification classification 
uh, simply based on uh, based on uh, a combination of the of the different uh, input. It should see the entire uh, entire image of the of the vortex to make uh, a, uh, to make the final uh, classification. So, in the future, we intend to uh, apply our uh, GC model to the uh, cases with the large meshes. So, it is inevitable for the GCN to uh, make uh, the wrong classification in this uh, in intermediate uh, region between different ranks. Uh, there are two possible uh, approach approaches that we would like to try. The first one is that uh, no, we want to use uh, um, a multi-grid method embedded in a closed adrenaline to uh, first decrease the um, uh, de uh, to to decrease the data data size. And another approach is to we we need to search a fully parallel parallel parallelized uh, GCN uh, algorithm. So uh, in conclusion, we propose that a, a graph convolution uh, neural network mo model to to uh, identify, identify the vortex region. And uh, we uh, selected a combination of three universal vortex indicators as the input. And uh, uh, our proposed uh, GCN model can accurately, accurately identify the vortex location in different 2D cases. However, uh, in our preliminary uh, extension to the 3D cases, uh, GCN model um, struggles to give us a, a very uh, a meaningful classification. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, a ongoing work, and uh, we also test its uh, applicability to distributed uh, safety data. So uh, that's all. Thanks. Thanks, one. Uh, we have time for one question. Ah, sorry. And I will ask you afterwards. Uh -uh. Um, so I saw that you followed a, like a supervised learning approach to train your uh, model, right? Yeah. So it means that your model will only be ever as good as like the um, the criterion that you use to uh, generate the ground truth data. So can you perhaps um, follow an alternative strategy with like, you know, you need to do something unsupervised learning to beat the already existing um, um the already existing criteria um so why use your model instead uh, of just calculating the existing criterion directly like is the question unclear um sorry you you mean uh it's better to use uh unsupervised uh, algorithm to uh to to find the best uh, criteria to indicate the vortex location no, no, no. Rather, I was saying, you know, if you use supervised learning, yeah. your model will only, you know, it, let's say your model has like 100% accuracy. Mm -hmm. It's only ever as good as the, um, like the criterion that you used, like the vortex detection criterion that you used to um, generate the ground truth data, right? No, the ground truth data is not generated by these uh, three inputs. Okay, how do you generate the ground truth data? Ah, for the... For, for the for the ground truth, the position of the vortex and the, the shape of the vortex is uh, is labeled manually. Okay, you label it manually. Yes. All right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thanks again. So we close the conference. I have a question if you want.